Oh, I actually just did. Oh, I did my homework. Hey. I did it even when I wasn't here. Second commandment. Matching section. Teaching man-made teachings and calling them God's word. What number do you have there, Tyler? Four. Five. Number four. Oh. What? Ha. Yep. What? But wait, bro, wait, bro, what? what's the difference between lie by God's name and deceive by God? There's a very much difference. I had a very much I, difference. I, I Can you Lying is talking. You're saying something. Deceiving, you aren't necessarily have wait. to say anything. Oh. So pretending to be a Christian, that would be five. Deceived oh, by God's I name. Okay, wait. See, there's a similarity there, but I think there's a little bit of a distinction. If you're teaching, you have to be speaking and, and saying something, so you're lying. Calling upon God to be your witness that you are telling the truth. Elena. Two. Two. Swear. Calling upon God to damn or hurt someone or something. Ethan. Um, number one. Number one, to curse. Speaking evil of God or making fun of his word, Emma. Uh, what? Uh, blasphemy. Blaspheme, number seven. Yeah, that's what I meant. Practice or belief in the occult, which is put above belief in God and his word. Occult to, to uh, Satan and... What number you got there, Tyler? Um, superstition. Three, superstition. And everything that God tells us about himself and his word, Lucas... Last one. What number you got then? Six. God's name. Then that was correction. You were to search the word. Our names are words by which we're called. Names do have meanings, though. Um, God's name is especially meaningful. So you were to look up those passages and tell what each name means. Jesus, Elena. Uh, the Lord saves. Yeah, the Lord saves. Emmanuel, Lucas. God with. Ethan Christ. Messiah. Messiah? What's Messiah mean then? The anointed one. Yep. I even knew that. Who broke the second commandment and how? First Samuel 28, Emma. First Samuel saw because he swore using God's name with the promise that could not be kept. Oh, and he used witchcraft. And he used witchcraft, yeah. Consulting a witch. Section as well. Medium. Medium. Look for Tyler. Um, that one is the devil. And how? Uh, he put God to the test. Yeah, he was tempting Jesus to worship him. Huh? Matthew twenty-six. Peter. Helena. Peter, what did he do? Uh, denied Jesus. Denied Jesus. And Acts eight. Lucas. Wait, Acts. Acts 8, yep, the last one on the page. Simon, because he was a sorcerer. Okay, Simon the sorcerer. Who kept the second commandment and how? Ethan, Luke 17, 11 to 13. The people in the town because they trusted God. Probably a better group of people there. Who are the people that were the focus of those verses? The leprosy guys. The leprosy guys. And what did they do? They called for help. They called to who for help? Jesus. God. So in their day of trouble, they called to Jesus, huh? Well, they prayed to Jesus for help. So the ten lepers there. Luke 17, 15, and 16, who specifically was the one there who kept the second commandment? Hmm? Emma. Me? Um, the man that came back to Jesus. Okay, the one leper, the Samaritan leper who was healed, who came back to thank Jesus. Luke 19. Tyler. Um, Hannah. Or wait, no. Nope. That's oh, next that's one. The Jews. What did they do? They praised him. They praised Jesus. Praise God. This was on Palm Sunday. huh? And then 1 Samuel chapter 1 there, Elena. Uh, Hannah. Hannah. What did she do? That? She prayed. She prayed to God. So, examples of people who kept that commandment. Third commandment. What's the third commandment again, Elena? Uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We'll look and see 
what the Sabbath is and how it is that we keep it holy. Um, how does God want us to regard his word? He gives to us his word in the Bible, and the, this third commandment really has to deal then with God's word. What was God's special will for his Old Testament people in regard to the Sabbath? Let's take a look at some passages here. Exodus chapter 35. So, seventh day, the Sabbath day, what, is that, what was that to be for the Old Testament in Israel? What does he say there? What were they to do? Or what weren't they to do? Yeah. They, were. they weren't to work. It was to be a day of what? Rest. A day of rest. Um, I didn't mean that they were just to lay around doing nothing. It was, it was to be a day that they gave attention to God's word. How serious was God about this? Oh, you're very serious. Yes, you had something to death. Like, as serious as, like, death. Yeah. I mean, when he says, okay, if you break the Sabbath, and you go out and work, you deserve to die. So God's very serious about that, isn't he? Leviticus 23, verse 3. Ethan, got it? Yeah. <laughs> there are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath day to the Lord. So again, it spells out that seventh day of the week, which would be what day? Saturday. Saturday was to be a day of rest in which they were not to not to work. So that have Saturday with on the weekend with no work kind of Wait, happened. Where's the answer? You just write days and not to work. Because Saturday is the seventh day. Hmm? Huh? What? For the first question. Because this is it's the Saturday, seventh day. What is the Old Testament Sabbath? The Old Testament Sabbath was a day of rest. But God says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, and it's to be a day of rest. You ever do work on Saturday? Uh, sometimes. Yeah, that's when you that's do all That's chore day. Work. That's chore day. So are you breaking the third commandment every time you do your chores no, on no, Saturday? No. no. Uh, the Old Testament Sabbath is no longer in effect for us. Why isn't it? Why don't we have to do that? Let's take a look at the passages here. Colossians chapter 2. Wait, were we wow. supposed to write um, what the Old Testament Sabbath? Just write it was a day of rest or okay. something to that effect. Okay. Okay, Colossians, that's in the New Testament. I think maybe we have it all together here at the end. If I remember. What book is it before? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And then the first one. It's like towards the end. It's before the Ephesians, Colossians, is that after Galatians? Yes. Lucas. Nine hundred and fifty-four. Okay. 
Go ahead and read it then. So 13, 14, you can skip 15 and read 16 and 17. When you were dead from in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal sins. And she stood against us and condemned us. She has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Let's get back to Therefore, 16, yeah. do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival. These are a shadow of these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So he says when point uh, we were dead in sin, God made us alive in Christ. And what does it say that he did with that that written law, that written code, the, the regulations and the rules that were written down. Verse 14, what does he say happened to those? Cancel. Cancel them. By, ultimately, by nailing them to the cross with Jesus. And so, then in verse 16, he says, don't let anybody judge you by whether or not you obey the Sabbath or whether you follow certain rules and regulations. Because what does he say those things were? What was their purpose then if if they're no longer in place? Verse 16. Or verse 17. What does he say they were? A shadow. A shadow of things to come. If you're standing around the corner from somebody and you see their shadow, what do you know? They're, they're there. there. They're there. And what are you looking at? Their shadow. Their shadow. What happens if that person walks out around? the corner. Do you keep looking down at their shadow? No, no you look back up at them. Now you're, you're looking at them, aren't you? Around. You don't really care about their shadow anymore, do you? That shadow isn't, isn't really important at that point because now they're there. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us there, those Old Testament ceremonies and regulations, including the Sabbath day were. We saw that the Old Testament Jews could see Jesus is coming, the Savior's coming. They'd see the Jesus in these shadows. But once Jesus came and accomplished his work, is there any longer any purpose or need for those shadows? No, because now you're focused on Christ and, and his work. And so those Old Testament ceremonies, including the Sabbath, are no longer something that we have to follow. Matthew 11, 28 and 29, what's the rest that we have then? those two verses, please. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What does Jesus invite us to do? Learn. And receive what from him? Rest. What's the rest? that we receive from Jesus. Heaven. What's that? No sin. No sin. Ultimately, heaven. huh? It's rest from our sins. It's rest in that forgiveness that he gives, which ultimately results in the rest of eternal life in heaven. Um, so the Old Testament Sabbath as a day of rest was to remind the people and to be a shadow of the fact that the Savior is going to come and he's going to give you a true and lasting rest by taking away all of your sins and giving you eternal life in heaven. Uh, Jesus speaks there about 
being yoked with him. A yoke. What's a yoke that he speaks of there? Yeah, that's, think of the, the bar that goes across. Maybe you have a couple oxen or a couple draft horses that are going to pull a wagon or a plow. And that kind of bar that goes across the back of their necks to, to hook them together. Um, goes around and together with the harness. Uh, that's the yoke. And so Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, would you think a yoke like that would be something easy? No. Nope. Don't you think of that being a hard, huh? You got to work at it, pulling at it, whatever it is. Why is Jesus' yoke easy then? Who's doing all the work when it comes to our salvation? Jesus. Jesus is. And so, maybe you're those in class last year remember we used kind of the picture that if you had a big ox yoked together with a little house cat <laughs> uh, kind of a silly picture but now if they're going to pull a wagon loaded down with all sorts of uh, heavy stuff who's going to be doing all the work the ox, the ox. cat maybe going to curl up and take a nap there huh uh, because you're not going to have to do any work well when it comes to our salvation who's done all the work in paying for sin jesus, jesus. And so if we're yoked together with him in that way, it's easy, isn't it? The burden is, is light because Jesus has, has borne our sins. And so that's what the Sabbath was to picture. And since Jesus has come and fulfilled the Sabbath, why we no longer have to set aside Saturday as a, as a day of, of rest. So the Old Testament Sabbath was a day of rest and was to picture the rest Jesus gives us by the forgiveness of sins. So I think that's actually the first two questions, isn't it? Yeah. So the second one you say it was it pictures the rest Jesus gives us by the forgiveness of sins. Well, you want to write it for me? <laughs> yeah. So if the Old Testament Sabbath is no longer in effect, what does God want for us, his New Testament believers, in regard to the third commandment? How do we still keep the Sabbath day holy? Let's take a look at some things. First Timothy two verse four. It's certainly gonna be part of it. Before Hebrews. Got it, Tyler? So what does that tell us that God wants? All people all people to go to heaven. To he wants all people to be saved, and I was points to how does that happen? What do they need to know? What do they need to come to know? Jesus. Well, how does he put it there in that verse? What do they need to know? The truth. The truth. And that truth, then, ultimately is the truth about Jesus and what he's done, isn't it? Where do we find that truth about Jesus? In the Bible. In the Bible. So God, we might say, first of all, wants all people to come to know his word, his truth, which is found in, in the Bible. Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11. Hebrews. Emma? Mm -hmm. um, nine. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the 
people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Yeah, and what does it say that God wants there? What does he want us to do? What is he, what is he prepared for us? A rest, a Sabbath rest in heaven, huh? And he wants everyone to enter there. Uh, to do that, what has to happen? We have to remain in the faith, huh? You know, the picture, kind of picturing that running the, the race of faith, huh? Um, the finish line is ultimately goes when our life comes to an end here on earth, and the Lord takes us to heaven. Uh, we run with Christ, um, and and what he's he's picturing there, huh? Uh, make every effort to enter that rest. Well, what efforts do we make to enter that rest? We just talked earlier about the fact Jesus has done it all, so what's the effort that we now as Christians can do? Um, try to follow his word. Try to follow his word, and I suppose what do we have to do if we're going to follow his word to begin with? Know it. We have to know it. We have to study it. So a lot of that effort is a matter of studying and hearing and learning his word. John 5, verse 24. How do we have that that eternal life, that eternal rest? Through Jesus. Through Jesus and through his word. Through his word. And yeah, you have the picture there. We go with Jesus, a parable of the sower and the seed. You know, the seed really is, is God's word. And falls on, on different types of soil. In some cases it falls on the path. The devil takes it away and people... Get any benefit? Don't hear it. Uh, doesn't sink in. Um, I suppose uh, others fall among the thorns. What happens? The thorns choke it out. Others fall on the rocky soil. It springs up, but then when it gets hot, there's no root system. There's enough moisture. It withers and dies. And then there's the good soil. And there's, God wants us to be that good soil, doesn't He? He wants that seed to take root, to bear fruit, uh, to produce that that faith that lasts to eternal life. Although I suppose at times, all of us are like some of those other soils, aren't we? Um, think of that. What was, uh, for instance, what was the sermon text for this last Sunday? Um, uh, uh, oh, I know it. Oh, I know it. I know it. it, was about it might be not all that difficult to think of you know, Paul's words in Philippians that um, for me to live is Christ to die is gain yeah, that, that that section that, but but think about how sometimes maybe even in church or Sunday school or even here in confirmation your mind kind of wanders yeah. mm -hmm. and you maybe hear the word huh and you hear the passage but it kind of almost goes in one ear and out the other huh that's kind of like the seed on the path other times uh, we think of the, the seed that is up on the, the rocky ground. Um, maybe we have troubles and problems, huh? Mm -hmm. And what do we what do we think about? Well, I'm not instead of being focused on God and His promises, I'm focused on all those problems, and I don't trust those promises because I'm worried about all sorts of things. Or the thorns. Maybe what happens? Maybe when friends want you to go do something that's wrong. Instead of listening to God's word and trusting him again, I let the temptations and the, the pleasures and the, and the 
you know, my, my friends maybe kind of choke out that word. So at times, uh, we're guilty too. Um, but the Lord has worked that faith in our hearts so that uh, we're that good soil that produces those fruits. Colossians 3, verse 16. does he want us to do then? To let the word what? Grow. Grow? It doesn't speak so much about growing in there. What's the word he uses? What's that? Dwell. Dwell. If something's dwelling in you, if it's living in you, what does that mean? It's there. It's a big part of you, isn't it? Um, it Maybe think in, in terms of, you know, if something's in your heart, huh? Living in your heart. That's something that's really important to you, isn't it? Something that you're going to to want to know well, and so then what, you know, now we're able to to teach and correct, admonish each other with with the word and encourage one another with that. But to have that word dwell in us. So God wants all people to learn His word, believe it, and, and be saved. I don't know if you have a spot for that one. Um. Uh. What? Are we on number three yet? No. No. So that's what God wants. He wants us to have a love for his word. He wants all people finally to come to know that word. Now, how do people disobey God's word? How do they disobey the third commandment? Let's look at some examples. Luke 10, verse 16. Does he warn? What will some people do? To the word? They will reject. Huh? They will just out and out say, nope, I'm not going to believe that and, and turn away from it. Hebrews 10 verse 25. And some people will do, and that we're not to do. Don't do what? Give up. Give up what? Um, meeting. Don't give up meeting together. Where do we generally meet together? Church. Church. So, and if people are going to reject God's word, they're not going to even come to hear it, are they? Well, not only are they not going to study it on their own, but but they're not going certainly not going to then come to to church and gather with other believers to listen to to that word. Look at that passage. What does God want? Does he want us to be in church together with other believers? Yeah. For the purpose of hearing his word. And as he points out, what's the, the day? All the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day he's talking about there? Judgment day. Huh? Well, he warns us things are going to get worse. There's going to be evil in the world. And as we see those things, it should remind us of his return to judge. And remind us of our need to study the word. And to hear the word. Luke 8 verse 14. Emma? The seed that 
fell among the thorns stand for who's stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way as they go on their way, they are choked by word by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. Mature. Yeah, we kind of talked about that with Jesus' parable of the different soils. Here's the one. What happens to that word to these people? What are they? What are they more concerned about? The world. The world. The things of this life, huh? and so they become focused. Whether it be the good things, the the pleasures and treasures, or maybe the problems and and the worries, but they're they're worried about all of those things. So that now. The word gets crowded out, choked out of out of their life. First John two verse fifteen. he say? What does he warn us against? And it would be a breaking of the third commandment. Loving. Loving what? The world. Loving the world. And if so a person's focus is on the world and the things of this life, what's going to happen to God's word? It's going to start to dust in a corner. <laughs> collect dust in the corner, yeah. Their Bible is going to collect dust in the, in the corner there. Um, oh, so much like the previous passage where Oh, those thorns, the worries of, of life, and the pleasures of treasures choke out that word. Here too, the love of the world will choke out the love for God and choke out his word. James 1. James 1, James is after Hebrews. Lucas 22-24 Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says it is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So what does he tell us there we're to do with the word? Remember it. Remember it. Follow it. Huh? Obey it. Listen to it. Not just not just hear it. Huh? Yeah, if your parents come to you maybe with some instructions about things you're supposed to do and you stand there and you listen to them really well. Huh? Give them your full attention. And then you turn around and go do something else, completely <laughs> different. Are they are they satisfied? Well, they listened, huh? Is, are they going to be happy then? No. Not, not at all, happy. huh? Um, <laughs> the fact that you listened and maybe can repeat everything they said right back to them doesn't mean much if you aren't going to follow it, does it? Uh, if we sit and listen to God's word and hear it preached and proclaimed, but... Then as soon as, let's say, we walk out the doors of the church, we kind of dismiss it and go do whatever we want. Have we really given God any honor? Mm -hmm. Not really, have we? I mean, here he uses kind of what would be a silly picture, huh? person goes and he looks in the mirror, you know, fixes his hair up, and then he turns around and he doesn't have any clue what he looks like, huh? Well, that's kind of a, a silly thing. You don't immediately forget what you what you look like and what you just just looked at. Um, so God wants us not only to listen to his word, um, but to, to follow it, to obey it. So, person disobeys the third commandment, we say, by refusing to hear God's word, by letting other things crowd, crowding out, or by refusing to 
believe and obey it. So you really got three there. The first one would be simply by refusing to hear it. Yeah, and that's the person who rejects. That's the person who doesn't uh, want to, to gather together to hear the word. That's the, the seed on the path that the, the devil scoops up without ever hearing it. Uh, the other would be then by, number two would be by letting other things crowd it out. We become more focused on the things of this world so that we don't have time for God's word or we aren't really concerned about it because we're concerned about other things. Or then, by not obeying it. You say, well, that sounds good, but I'm going to do my own thing anyway. What does God want us to do then? The positive things that he wants in regard to the third commandment. Acts 17, verse 11. So what did the Bereans do that was a good example? Um, they they um, fact-checked it. <laughs> they fact-checked what Paul was saying by going to their Bibles, huh? They were eager. And they were eager to do that, huh? Was it, well, I suppose it's time for us to go to the synagogue today and listen to somebody teach God's Word. I guess we'll, we'll go. We usually do. We're supposed to. But they were eager to do that. And they went, Jesus, and then when they heard Paul teach and tell them that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of these promises in the Old Testament, they went and checked. You know, they got out their Bibles and they went, yep, Paul's telling us the truth. This this is true. And they, they believed and, and were happy to hear that. Um, so God wants us too, doesn't he, to go back to study our Bibles, to, to check and see what we're being taught is true. Um, and to do that, you know, listen to that word eagerly, to study that word eagerly. Uh, but you have something to say, Tyler? Uh, I, heard, question? I heard, like, this story, this Thessalonian story or whatever, um, at 4 a.m. last year when we were going deer hunting oh. on the radio. Psalm 119, verse 72. Tyler's turn. Oh, the law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. But how does the psalm writer feel about God's word? It's valuable to him. How valuable? More than, more than silver. Gold. More than silver or gold. More than even a great amount of silver and gold. What makes God's word so precious? It's salvation. It's salvation, yeah. 
Think of that. The, God's word uh, does what nothing else can, huh? It gives eternal life. Um, and you know, how much do you, would you pay for eternal life in heaven? Uh, a lot. You know, an awful lot, huh? Um, and yet God gives it free of charge through his, through his word. Um, so certainly we recognize it as, as valuable and, and love and cherish it. John 6, verse 45. Again, what does Jesus tell us that he really wants us to do? Come to him. Come to him and listen to him. Listen to him. Right. Learn from him. Be taught by him. Huh? Be taught by God the Father through through his word. So we listen to, to his teaching. What do you think of what's the greatest good work that a Christian can do? Listen. Um the greatest good work is ultimately to listen. If we listen to God's word, what's going to happen to all those other good works? They're going to come, aren't they? And we're going to go and we're going to, to do the things that God wants us to do. But first of all, and most importantly, God wants us to sit and to listen to him and, and I suppose be fed and served by him. Uh, yeah. Two, your parents come with instructions again on chores that you're supposed to do. Are they necessarily going to be happy? If you say, oh, I'm going to go do that. I'll be fine. And you don't listen to their instructions? I know. Probably not, because probably what's going to happen? Um, you're, going to, you're, you're probably going not going to do it quite right, are you? Or you're not going to do exactly what you're supposed to. Or maybe after you get started, you'll decide, well, maybe I don't really want to do this even. huh? Yeah. But if, you're, if you listen to them, first of all, to their instructions and their encouragement, that's important. Well, even more so when it comes to God's word. The first thing and the greatest thing he wants us to do is to listen. John 10, 20 verse 31. Here we're reminded why we want to listen and why we need to listen. 20, 30. Ethan? But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So why did John write his gospel? Why is the Bible written and given to us? So that what might happen? We will believe. So that we will believe and that through that faith we will have eternal life. If God didn't give us the Bible, could we be saved? Probably not. We wouldn't. Because would we be able to figure out what Jesus had done? No. We wouldn't know those things. So um, we need that word because uh, we need to know the way of salvation and God gives us the word to reveal it to us. Luke 11, verse 28. Lucas. If that is how in God close. eleven Luke Luke eleven twenty eight. You're on the twelve. Oh whoops. Thank you. 
there he says we're we're blessed, receive blessing by doing what? Hearing the word and then obeying it, doing it. So God wants us not just to listen, but he wants us then to, to follow it. Mark 16, verse 15. What else does he want us to do then with his word? Share it. To share it, to preach it, to proclaim it to others. Share with those who don't know. So God wants us to hear, learn, believe, obey, and share his word. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Hear, learn, believe, obey, and share his word. Well, let's take a break there. This may be a good place for us to break. We've seen what God doesn't want us to do in regard to the third commandment. We see how He wants us to regard His word and to. Emma, are you paying attention? Yes, I am. To hear and obey it, um, and then we'll finish this up, and I think maybe we'll even be able to start the fourth commandment a little bit today. But let's go ahead. Let's join in the table prayer and return thanks.